Thank you. Water. I want you all to think back to when you got up this morning or last night or whenever it was that you got yourself a glass of water. Think of how easy it is to go in your fridge, get that water out, pour yourself a glass, and then go ahead and drink that. Well, the challenge that we have going forward as a society is it's becoming increasingly harder to supply water to everyone that actually needs it. Now, each and every one of us needs somewhere between two and four liters of water a day to survive. That's the amount that's required if you're fairly sedentary. If you're more active, you need a lot more. But as a global uh, community, we're starting to see that there's big pressures that are developing that are making it harder and harder to meet the needs of people across the planet. When we typically think of the lack of water, these are the kind of images that often come to mind, where we're looking at people in Southeast Asia that have rivers that are heavily polluted and obviously is not a very good, clean source of water. Or we think about images of people waiting in line in Haiti following the earthquake because all of their available water supplies were polluted. We also sometimes think of images of places like India, where they have depleted all of their groundwater reservoirs, or aquifers, and essentially now have to wait in line to try and get water from a tanker truck. So these are oftentimes the images that come to mind when we think about the lack of available water. But we don't have to go too far. We can actually just think back to a, the past summer and the drought that has afflicted much of the United States. And essentially, we can see that depending on where you are, you might have had lesser drought or you might have had a much more substantial drought. And one of the things that um, you can see is if you drive through parts of the Midwest, which I had the opportunity to do this summer, you see corn plants that look like these that are up here. These are about to the height of my knee. Now, I actually grew up in the Midwest. And one of the things that you do when you grow up in the Midwest and you're young is you work as a corn detasteler. Those of you that aren't familiar with what corn detasseling is, is you essentially walk down an aisle of corn and you pull the top of a tassel or the top of a corn plant off and you throw it on the ground and then you move on to the next one. It's really hot, sweaty, painful work. But when you're young and you have no money, it's a good thing to do. Uh, so you do that and I remember distinctly having to jump really high to try to reach the tops of some of these tassels. Now, I've grown a bit since then, but the corn's at my knee. So clearly there is something different about the corn this summer versus what I remember from growing up. Now, you might say, well, that's just a temporary thing. But the reality is, is that there's lots of places in the US, including in the desert southwest, as well as even around here, where we've got water supplies that are diminishing rapidly and sustainably over a long period of time. And this is just an image from the Hoover Dam. And what I want to point out in this image is that the white line that you see in the rock, that is water that has receded below that point. It historically was at that interface between the dark rock and the white rock. But as the water has depleted within this lake, it has exposed all of this rock. So one of the things that we tend to think about when we talk about water is the water that actually we sit and drink on a daily basis. But the reality is that that's very little of the water that we use in our daily lives. It ends up being only 3.6%. We use about 4.4% to make the things that we use in our daily lives, cell phones, computers, tables, whatever. And then the remaining 92% actually is used for agriculture, whether it's to water our crops or whether it's to actually feed the animals and things that we ultimately are gonna eat. So this is what we have to think about is this water footprint in terms of all of the water that we have to supply. So why do we have this oncoming crisis? There's essentially four drivers. The first of these is population. Back in 1800, there were only one billion of us on this planet. But as of just this past year, 2011, there were seven billion of us. We get to the middle of this century, there's gonna be nine billion people on this planet. And we all have seen signs of what this means. We see things like traffic is becoming much, much worse. We see that uh, airplanes are more common in the sky wherever you are. And essentially, it gets down to the point where you can truly reach out and touch someone, as the old AT&T ads used to say, much more easily than you ever historically were able to do. So our second driver for the impending water crisis 
is climate change. Essentially, we've gone up in temperature over the last 100 years, and we're going to continue to go up in temperature. And that has some very drastic implications in terms of water supply. And just as an example, we can think about glaciers. There's glaciers all over the planet that are melting away and receding. And that in and of itself is a bad thing if you like to go visit glaciers. But if, it's a, if you're using this glacier as your water source and you rely upon its snow melt, if the glacier is gone, you're not going to have that snow melt as your water source anymore. Our third driver for the impending water crisis is essentially uh, land use changes, where we hear, because there's so many people, we've now become a primarily urban society with greater than 50% of the population of the world living in cities like Manila in the Philippines. Or we might be living in places that are like Scottsdale, Arizona, where we have urban sprawl every place. So those are changes in our urban systems. But we also have substantial changes in rural systems, where we are changing the forests and the jungles of places like Indonesia into palm oil plantations. And that has severe implications on the local, regional, and international um, water cycles. Our fourth and uh, final driver of the impending water crisis is essentially income inequality. Whether we go to the favelas of a place like Rio de Janeiro or to the inner cities of Washington, D.C. or New York, we oftentimes see images like this. And these are people that are getting by on far too little. Now, to quite a quantify that in terms of water uh, usage, we can go back to this concept of a water footprint. And essentially, each and every one of us here in the United States uses on average something like 2,800 cubic meters per year per person of water. Now, that differs substantially from what people in a lesser developed country like the Democratic Republic of the Congo use. They use about 550. Now, ideally, we want to have their productivity increase and raise their economic standards. As we do that, they are going to need to use more water. So we have this growing challenge in terms of trying to supply water to all of them. So the question that you might be asking yourself is, what can we do? Well, first thing is that we can use less water, but the magnitude of all of those different drivers is so large that even if each of us uses less water, we're still not going to meet the demands of the future. The second possibility is to develop alternative water sources. So what are some potential alternative water sources that we're not using right now? One, we can use seawater, which works great if you live on an ocean. But if you live in Blacksburg, seawater is probably not going to be the best option. Uh, we might use rainwater, and that's going to be good if you have a continual uh, supply of rainwater across the entire year, and you don't have big, long periods of drought. But as we've just seen this past summer, we can not necessarily rely upon rainwater as a water source. And so then the third, and the one that most people are spending a lot of time thinking about, is actually taking wastewater. So the stuff that currently goes down the drain, we're going to think about using that as a water supply source. Now, a lot of people are thinking about this concept, and this is a quote up here from a National Research Council report. And the key point in all of this is that effectively, we have to be thinking about new paradigms for water supply. So how do we meet these demands given all of these drivers? But the challenge that we have is that within our waters, there's a lot of stuff that might be present in them that we don't have currently the capacity to remove very effectively. And this is just a sampling of what might we might find in a wastewater after it's been treated. And we have to make sure that we don't have any of this present in the water that we actually ultimately drink. But the thesis of our talk today is essentially that we believe that nanotechnology can be used to detect and remove a lot of these different water contaminants very effectively. There's been a substantial growth in the field of nanotechnology over the last 20 years, where we now can make things like long chains of carbon like carbon nanotubes, or flat planes of carbon, like graphene. Or we can make things like gold nanorods. All of these things are not necessarily available even 10 years ago, but they're now very common. So we want to apply these to actually thinking about this water crisis. And just to illustrate that, a couple of examples from work others have done is this is we can take these carbon nanotubes. Simply by taking carbon nanotubes and making a mat of them, we can then take that mat and we can filter water through it. If we filter water through it while we're applying a current to this mat, we essentially kill off everything that's present in there, and we get rid of the chemicals that are in there. In this case, they're killing off E. coli. We also can think about using nanotechnology to improve existing techniques. And one of the things that people do when they're trying to reuse wastewater is they rely upon membranes. So these are membranes that they push water through, 
And the challenge with that is that they get gunked up because stuff sticks to them. So people are thinking about the use of producing super hydrophobic nanoparticles. These are nanoparticles that nothing sticks to. And essentially, when you put them on a surface, nothing sticks to the surface. So that makes these an improved uh, process as well. Now, to illustrate what we do in our own lab, we spend time thinking about the application of nanotechnology for water quality monitoring. And what we really are doing is we're taking a nanoparticle and we're coating it with something that is specific for something that we want to detect. And then this gives us some very nice capacity. To illustrate how we do this, we've applied a lot of our work to try to detect pathogenic organisms that might be present in our water supply. And this guy up here, this is Giardia. Anybody that's ever gone backpacking and takes a drink from a stream and then feels sick afterwards, it's probably because of this guy. And essentially, we're interested in trying to detect them in water. And what we do is we take nanoparticles and we put some stuff on their surfaces that we can track. And the way to think about our use of nanoparticles in this case is that we're really developing a fingerprint. So we have these particles that they stick to our organism. If they stick, then we know that we have a fingerprint and that we can detect this. So just to illustrate how this works, I'm going to show it for two different organisms. Cryptosporidium, which is another disease-causing organism. And here's our uh, fingerprint for Cryptosporidium. Here's our fingerprint for Giardia. So essentially, we can detect these two organisms, which is really important because you want to make sure you know exactly what might be causing somebody to get sick simultaneously using our uh, nanoparticles. We've also done this with Staphylococcus aureus. Now, I just actually learned yesterday that a particularly virulent form of Staphylococcus aureus, known as MRSA, actually causes more deaths on a yearly basis than HIV, um, Parkinson's disease, and violent crimes in this country. So this is a very important guy to be trying to think about measuring. But essentially what I'm showing is that with our nanotechnology, where we have these particles that are producing a fingerprint, we can essentially detect Staphylococcus aureus in the midst of a whole milieu of other organisms simultaneously. And that's what you really have to do, is you have to be able to detect the needle in a haystack. And we can do it over a broad range. And again, we're really trying to get to this needle in a haystack, because we want to detect the one organism that might be making us sick. Now, when we're dealing with water, we're not necessarily just dealing with what's in this glass. We need to be thinking about what's in liters and gallons of water. So we actually have to develop some ways to extend, extend this to larger systems. And we can essentially take water, filter it through a filter, which is a very common thing, and then we analyze our system using our nanoparticles. And when we do that, we get what we expect. So we add 140 organisms, and we essentially measure 140 organisms, which is exactly what we want to do because we're approaching that needle in a haystack. Now, one of the things that I'm often asked about when I talk about the, this, our work in this area is what about the costs? You're talking about gold. You're talking about nanotechnology. Is this going to be way too expensive to do? And the reality is that because we're dealing with nanoparticles, it actually ends up being not too expensive. And just to illustrate that, if I'm thinking about the gold that is present in my wedding band, the amount of gold that's in here is about enough to produce 500,000 analyses, so half a million samples could be analyzed at a cost of maybe less than a half a cent per sample. So that's really cheap. The costs of the instrumentation to do what we're doing are falling continually. And we actually now have the capacity to develop techniques where we're relying upon paper as a very low-cost substrate to try to do a lot of what we're interested in applying. Um, as we go forward as a society, we really need to be thinking about not only doing this at a large treatment plant, which is where historically water has been treated, but we need to be thinking about it actually at somebody's tap or out in the field, and we have the capacity with nanotechnology to do that. So as we go forward as a global society, we really have to be thinking about water and how we can get it from being unclean to actually reusing it on site and reclaiming wastewater so that we can supply water to every single one of us. Thank you.